So, uh, hello everyone. So I'm Michael Brudno, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, right now about uh, genome assembly and uh, how genome assembly works in general, and a little bit more specifically how it applies to high throughput sequencing. And the stuff that uh, I'm going to talk about, you will actually have a chance to play around with in practice in the lab, which is conveniently going to be held sometime tomorrow. <laughs> Um, so, uh, oh, okay, so that was, should have been a better slide, and, uh, okay, so, um, so I guess to start with, uh, all of you are here because you want to learn about handling, uh, next generation sequencing or high throughput sequencing data, and, um, building genomes based on that. And uh, there are some questions which you want to ask yourself before you actually go about doing this. And the first and the most important one is what do you want to learn about the underlying genome? If you really want to get the whole genome from first base to last base, or if it gets a bacterial genome from first base to first base, uh, and uh, assemble it using just high throughput sequencing, odds are you're out of luck you will not be able to do this. You will uh, be able to get pieces of it. Sometimes you'll be able to get long pieces of it, but you will never or almost never be able to get the whole genome from start to finish unless it's something like a very small virus. Uh, it's just basi it's basically impossible with very short reads. So the question that you may want to ask, are you interested in comparing this genome to some other genomes? Are you interested in uh, what kind of variation then? SNPs, larger structural variations. Maybe you don't really need to do an assembly, and all you will need to do is detection of variation. Uh, if you're interested in predicting genes, can you somehow leverage other sources of information? You basically, you know, building a genome from scratch is going to be very difficult to impossible. Very important question is, do you have a finished similar genome? So very often you will actually have a close species of bacteria which was already sequenced via Sanger or via Know, some other technique, finish, high quality, and then maybe all you have to do is build, you can use that genome in order to help you build the one that you're actually working on. Very important question is do you have mate pair data? So if you have mate, mate pair or pair and data, it's very good. If you don't, you're basically, you should go back and get some parent data. <laughs> uh, it's uh, basically. Say something else, I'm sure. What? Oh. <laughs> um, um, Francis has no very good uh, So. Uh, <laughs> that should be easy. Uh, so, uh, so do you have mate pair or pair end data? Um, and another important question, do you have other read types? So if you have both Sanger type data and you know, high throughput sequencing, Illumina or solid data, it should be, you should be able to use them in order to leverage things to work together. And uh, another you know, somewhat important question is what computer power do you have available? For many of these programs that we're, that we're going to mention today, uh, compute power is not at all trivial. And actually, there are various trade-offs. Some tools will be very memory intensive. Other tools will be very CPU intensive. So if you have something that is, uh, if you have a ton of data, but you, if you have a machine with 32 gigabytes of memory, which is not that much uh, nowadays, but uh, that you can, will be able to run it. But if you don't, then you're stuck using other tools. And by the way, for everything that I talked today, please, please ask questions. Uh, I initially thought that this was uh, going to be a one-hour lecture. And thank you, Francis, for running over uh, for making my lecture a little bit shorter. But uh, yeah, so yeah. Uh, maybe this is just for me, but I'm kind of confused in mate pair and pair data. Uh -huh. Yeah, mate pair versus pair and data. Uh, it's actually a very, very good question. Um, I'm going to be mainly using the terms interchangeably. That's not exactly, uh, Francis is shaking his head, that's not exactly the right thing to do. So, uh, I'm wondering if I'll have a good slide on this, and I don't think I will not in this presentation. But basically, in mate pair data, you have a piece of DNA, 
where you're going to be sequencing each two ends. You're going to be going in from the left and going in from the right. And that's, that's made pair data. Pair end data, you're grabbing a piece of DNA, and you will be sequencing sort of the two pieces of it, one after the other, at some distance apart. The, the reason that the, the distinction is important is that the sizes of the, the, the distance between the two reads is going to be completely different using in the, in the two cases. If you're sequencing made pair data, you have to basically take your DNA and bend it into a circle so that you can start sequencing out from the same location. And for the DNA to basically bend into a circle, it has to be some minimum length, several, you know, around 500 base pairs. If you're doing pair end data, it can't be too big because you actually need to have somehow be able to sequence two pieces which are next to each other. Does that make reasonable sense? Yes, but uh, what is the biological relevance of doing or adopting these two techniques? So it's not, so the biological relevance is not really much. Some of the technologies will support one or the other. Some of them will support both. For example, in the case of uh, select, uh, Illumina or Selexa, I'll use Selexa because because I can't remember to use Illumina every single time. Um, so in the case of uh, Illumina, uh, they all, I think they do not support made pair data. And Francis can tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure they only do pair end. Uh, in the case of Solid, they actually only do made pairs. They do not support reading two reads some distance apart from each other. And this is basically a difference in chemistry. So it's more what your technology can give you Although I've heard rumors that uh, Solid will soon come out with a pair end strategy. I, didn't, I don't know if Selexa is coming out with a made pair strategy, probably there. I can't remember if I know. Sorry? We're going to ask, well, we can ask him about the, the Solid. I think, I'm pretty sure that's, I've heard this from multiple people, so it probably it's true. So, you know, given this, what are your options? Well, it goes back to what do you want to learn? You know, variation within the species or conservation between species. You can try to build a genome from scratch. You'll get some nice pieces. Probably you won't get the whole thing. You can try to do reference assisted assembly uh, where you actually use a related genome in order to uh, help assemble. Uh, but you will miss some differences between the reference and what you're trying to assemble. Especially difficult are copy number variants, and we'll have a chance to talk about that later. Uh, if one of the genomes has two copies of a certain element while the other genome has a single copy, that's very difficult to capture uh, with the references to the template. You can also just um, map reads to a reference genome and not even worry about uh, um, you know, doing any kind of assembly. This is great if you want to discover variation uh, but, you know, if you don't have a reference, then obviously this doesn't go anywhere. Uh, also, same problems as when you can do, for doing reference to the template. You miss things which are not in the reference, or which are hard to find in the reference. So, uh, mapping versus assembly. Uh, you have a reference genome. Uh, you want to find SNPs and index. Uh, yeah, this is called genome resequencing, and um, this is great for somatic mutation detection, SNP discovery, structural variation discovery, as we'll talk about. But one of the problems is dealing with non-uniqueness. You ever read with maps to multiple locations? What do you do with it? Maybe it maps perfectly to one location with one change in the other one. Well, then you can probably send it there. But it's even more difficult if it maps with one change to each one, and maybe different changes. So you really do not know where to send this read. Uh, in the case of the normal genome sequencing, it's great. You won't have these problems, but you'll get gaps. You'll get pieces which you don't know the order of or their orientation of. It's obviously easy to try to combine this. First do the novel, and then try to take the resulting context and map them. And that's actually a very, very powerful technique, which is used a lot. OK. so. Just sort of as a little overview, whole genome shotgun sequencing. Start with a piece of DNA, and you have a sequencing machine, which generates these pieces called reads. And uh, these reads are uh, very hard to see. For whatever reason, the uh, 
the colors got destroyed. Uh, these should be red and blue, not red and red. Uh, but uh, there are two colors, and these are reads coming from the two strands of DNA, right? Uh, computer scientists like me tend to think that DNA is a string, and they tend to forget that it's actually a molecule which has two strands. Um, so, minor detail. Then there is an assembler, uh, which is basically a program written in your favorite programming language, uh, which will hopefully will generate for you contacts. And after some finishing, you want to, you should be able to get the final genome. And finishing is usually expensive and time consuming, so how well the assembler works really will dictate how well you can do with it. Finally, you know, what kind of, what does this data look like? This is what Sanger data may look like. Lots of, you know, relatively short pieces of DNA, and assembling these was considered a really, really big challenge 10 years ago, and uh, they talked about how difficult it was to build the human genome. And, uh, Today we have next generation sequencing, which gives you a ton more reads, but they're even shorter. So the problem is very difficult. Uh, and here is an illustration actually of the mate pair, which is uh, what we asked about earlier. Two pieces of DNA, which are some distance apart. And if this was a pair and sequencing, then they would be facing both like this. So what an assembler. So I'm a computer scientist, now I'm going to give you a computer scientist definition of an assembler. It uh, takes a set of strings over A, C, G, and T, and uh, gives the output a common superstring of the reads of, this, of these strings. So for example, we have these three strings, and this is a superstring in that it contains all of these, these ones. So are there any people in the room who consider themselves sort of computer scientists? A couple, a few. So, what's wrong with this definition? There are many possible outputs. Yeah, not just many. There's as many as you want possible outputs because uh, I never specified anything about that superstring. Uh, there are, you can have a superstring by taking these strings and sticking anything you want in between them, and that would be a perfectly valid superstring. And while that may seem like a very pedantic point, it's actually a relatively important point uh, because any way that you further try to constrain the problem may lead to problems in the assembly. Because all you really know is you had some genome, you sampled some pieces from it, and this is you know before we even consider such things as sequencing errors. Uh, you know, there's as many outputs as you want. It's, yeah. So initially, when people thought about this, they said, "Well, why not the shortest common superstring?" Uh, and, uh, you know, there's multiple ways of putting these reads together. Why not find the one which is the shortest? Well, there's two problems with that. One is sort of a computational problem, and the other is a biological problem. The computational problem is that this is what's known in computer science as NP-hard, which means that uh, it's very, very difficult to do computationally. A bigger problem was that this uh, uh, is uh, biologically not very sensible because it leads to something called over-collapsing of the repeats. Imagine that you have some segment which is present in the genome multiple times. There is absolutely no reason for you to use it multiple times in building the shortest common superstring. Hence, you will get all of many copies of the repeats collapsed into a single location. So this, turned, this was the first earliest approaches to this, and it turned out to be exactly the wrong thing to do. To do. There have been alternative approaches which have been proposed, and these are based on something called the Bruin graphs, which I'll talk more about in string graphs. And uh, these two have been, uh, so um, if you, um, if you, you know, read Gulliver's Travels, they uh, have the, the, this war about Big Endian versus Little Endian. Right, so uh, uh, there was uh, the Lilliputians, and they, they had a war between two sides about which end of the egg to crack. Whether you know when you're cracking an egg, you should crack it from the big end or the little end. <laughs> um, so this was meant to be a parody of um, uh, religious wars in uh, in the Renaissance and early modern Europe. So uh, the Bruin graphs and string graphs are very much like that. They really are two sides of the same egg, 
uh, and uh, you know, these, and the groups have been, I wouldn't call it a religious war, but close to it, about which of these approaches is right. And there will be, you know, people who will adamantly say, our approach is a De Bruyne graph approach, and that's the exact right way to do it, versus the string graph approach. They really are two sides of the same. The, one of the key things is that both of these formulations are also anti-hard. They're formulating these um, approaches. If you read the papers, both of them try to hide it. The fact that they, they make arguments about that their approaches are computationally easier for one reason or another. It's not true. They're all anti-hard. Uh, uh, there, there is no free lunch. Well, if they're really hard to solve computationally, um, can we, you know, why, why do we try to do it like this? If this is going to be computationally really difficult? Well, an answer is that there is a big difference between theory and where it can be hard in practice into whether it actually can be implemented. And to explain this, I sort of have a, a little a, a rough joke where um, biologists and mathematicians were asked to predict the outcome of horse races. Uh, so, you know, a biologist you know, decided to look at all the horses and study their uh, study their evolution and study their lineages all the way back to the time of Genghis Khan and uh, came up with a model which was able to predict the winner of a horse race 50% of the time and was very happy about this. A mathematician uh, drew some integrals, had some complex formulas, and the fan said, hey, I have a model which predicts the winner of horse races 100% of the time, but it works for a spherical horse in a vacuum. Uh, so uh, this is the difference between theory and practice. That uh, in theory it's anti-hard; it should be very complicated. In practice, we have very good ways of making the things work. So what are these De Bruyne graphs? These magical contraptions, which you know, totally make things easier. And uh, imagine that you again have a set of strings and nodes. So I'm going to build a graph. Hopefully, some graph doesn't scare any of you. Uh, a graph that has nothing to do with graph paper. It's a thing with nodes and edges. So nodes in the graph are, will be k minus one mers from the set of strings. So if this is a set of strings that I got, every single k minus one, so this is a k mer, a string of length k, k minus one would be two in this case, and every single one of them should be somewhere in this graph. Wow. I managed to get the buttons. Okay, so AG is right here, you know, PC is right here, and so on. And just sort of uh, a little bit of terminology the set of KMERS in the genome is called a K spectrum. And finding the shortest string with a given K spectrum is something called, uh, is a, something called the Chinese Postman problem. Um, this is a you know this is a classical pro program problem in computer science and Fezner in '89 sort of showed the way to do this uh, that if you had every single camera that was present in the genome you could find really easily computationally the genome that has all of them um, the shortest genome that has all of them and it works by something called Eulerization and this has to do with a classic problem in computer science called uh, the Bridges of Kenningsburg. So the question, uh, uh, there was a map of uh, the Pr Prussian, now Russian, city of Königsberg, uh, where uh, the city had, had islands and bridges which connected the islands. And the question was, could you traverse all of the bridges of the city without going on any bridge twice? And uh, the solution turned out to be, you know, whether this is possible, turned out to be a really simple problem. You can do it as long as from every single, and, and return to the same place. So traverse every single bridge and return to your original location. Uh, you can do it if and only if every single island is bordered by an even number of bridges. If there's an even number of bridges from every island. If this is the case, you can do it. If this is not the case, you cannot do it. So same thing is true here. If every single node has an even number of edges going or equal number of edges going in and going out you can do it otherwise you can't but in this particular case that's you know you cannot do it this graph had initially in two edges coming in but only one edge going out so you would be the second time basically you come into this node you will never be able to leave which is why you wouldn't be able to do it 
Uh, so, but there is something called, there's a technique called Eulerization, which is to make making the graph Eulerian. And uh, uh, Euler was from this, uh, lived for a while in the city of Kenningsburg, which is why, you know, it's called an Eulerian tour. It was one of the first who formulated this solution to this problem. Uh, so, uh, to make the graph Eulerian, basically you add edges to it, so to make it balanced, make it so that you have an equal number of edges going in and going out. So, this, uh, adding this edge, this red edge, actually two edges, to here and then to there, will make it balanced. Yeah? Most of it. So when you talked about uh, k minus one more, like from the there are three more than you put the earlier two more. So is there any specific way to do ah, that? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so what I did is this. I should have been a bit more specific about how I did this. So every single k minus one more became a node. Every k more becomes an edge now between two nodes. So if you have a three more GCA, that becomes an edge between GC and CA. So that this edge really spells GCA. C is common there. C is common, okay. exactly. So actually k minus one letters will be common. Uh, so GC to CA. So this, this edge becomes GCA. So yes, thank you. That explains why everything else that I said afterwards, which is that you know every <laughs> single edge <laughs> becomes an original tamer on the graph. And now you want to go through the graph so that you traverse every single tamer, every single edge, at least once, but as few times as possible. So that's, that's exactly the formulation. Yes. Thank you. So this Eulerization technique basically adds the fewest number of edges to make the graph Eulerian or balanced. And once it's balanced, you can go through every edge exactly once. So, OK. So another important thing about um, DNA uh, is that, as I mentioned, it's not a string, it's a molecule. And in the graph which I just showed you, one of the things I had was that everything was a string, actually. Right? Everything here was just a regular string of DNA, string of letters A, C, G, and T. How is DNA different from a string? Well, it's got the two strands. So this is actually what DNA looks like sort of in a cartoonish way. So <coughs> how, the question you may ask, how can two DNA molecules overlap? How can, if I have two DNA molecules, how can I join them together? And it turns out that there are several ways of doing this. So imagine this AAC and CTTT. They could overlap by this letter C right here. Or imagine this AAC and this TCG. Well, I would have to flip TCG in order to get the G to align with the C. Right? So on the reverse strand. And uh, in this case, I actually have to flip both of them. So A C gets flipped, and well, no, I flipped the first one, sorry. Flip neither, flip the second, flip the first. So these are the possible ways of having things overlap. And this can be modeled by something called a bidirected graph, where I actually have a direction on not on an edge, but on a node. And uh, <laughs> there's three types of edges in the bidirected graph. They are called sort of, there's a regular edge, you know, an out pointing to an in, but there's also an out pointing to an out or an in pointing to an in. These model the ways that DNA molecules can overlap and the fact that DNA is actually not a string, but is in reality double-stranded. And bidirected graphs actually turn out to be really similar to di directed graphs in that a walk, uh, you can define it something called a walk on it, so a very valid way of traversing it. But this is going to be, there's, it's going to be a little bit tricky. For example, this is not going to be a valid walk. Why? Well, because here, you start at an AT, and then you go into a TT, right? From an AT, it will overlap the TT by one T, so you can go into this node. 
but a TT does not overlap a GT or an AC. Only a, a, a does. So if you go through like this, that's not really a valid string of DNA, which you can which you cannot never parse a valid string of DNA from here. So the key thing in order to figure out walks in bidirected graphs is that you always have to balance your edges. So if you go into a node on an something just pointing out, you have to leave on something that's pointing in. So from here, you can go down, or you can go, but you can't go straight. And from here, you can go down as well, but you can't go straight. And you can see this will actually spell it out, string of DNA. This will be G, T, 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 G. So the cool thing about bidirected graphs is that they completely let you forget about double-strandedness once you sort of get them into your head. Um, take a look at this. If you start from here and do this walk this way, you will spell the following string. G, G, T, A, A, T. What if you take the exact same walk and walk it backwards? Oops. Sorry. Wrong button. You will spell A, T, T, G, T, T. And what's the relationship between the two strings? They're the same string of DNA. They're the same DNA molecule, just the two strands of it. So the two walks on the bidirected graph, whether you walk it one way or another way, will actually give you the two strands of DNA. It's sort of an example. This is a, actually a great example of uh, theoretical computer science um, inventing something and then finding an application for it. So bidirected graphs, as they relate to computational biology, uh, were sort of, well, not invented, but it, th this was found by Kitsche Cheoglu uh, in 92. Uh, and then uh, we were doing some research in bidirected graphs and decided to Google them. Uh, and Kitsche Cheoglu in 92 didn't have Google. That's you know a great research tool. So we Googled them, and it turned out that bidirected graphs were invented by a theoretical computer scientist back in the 1960s. The problem is he didn't know what to do with them. So they were basically forgotten. He invented this sort of this formulation. He's like, but who needs it? And uh, nobody used it. And then uh, Kachichoglu used it, but without realizing that there was that they were known back in the 60s. Um, so this is, for example, the bidirectness using De Bruyne graphs. So imagine that you had this DNA string. These are all of the k-mers which you would generate from it. And you would build some graph which looks like this if you were dealing with directed string, uh, de with regular strings. Unfortunately, what you really have is for every single k-mer, you have its reverse complement as well. And for some of them, the reverse complement is itself. Let's see if I have any examples here. Uh, and the graph would actually look like this. And what you need, right, once you add all of the reverse complements of chambers, and what you need is now two walks which are reverse complements of each other. And this is obviously somewhat, you know, it doesn't seem as obvious how to do anymore. But by going to a bidirected graph, it's very easy to see that there is a simple walk through these nodes, which uses these two twice. So bidirected graphs are really an easier way of thinking about the DNA sequences. And uh, all of, almost all of the assembly tools now use these bidirected graphs. Uh, they're, sort of, they're really elegant from a computational perspective. So what are the downsides of a De Bruyne approach? What is the first sort of, you know, these the assemblers which are based in the De Bruyne approach? The first thing they do is they take the DNA sequences which you got and split them into k -mers. Split them into strings of length k. And there really isn't any huge motivation in order to do it. There's actually very often very few disadvantages to doing it. When you're dealing with really, really short reads, your k will almost be the size of your read. And then you don't lose much information. But if you're dealing with long, sorry, with longer reads, 
then there's obviously you're going to lose information by splitting your read into subsegments of length k. And all of the De Bruyne-based approach, they will do the split into length k, and then they will add really complicated computational steps in order to salt, go back then and to reconstruct the reads. Because you could theoretically get a path which is not compatible with the read if it's longer than k. Because all that we asked about is that you go through every single camera. Um, it's also, well, so this is a big argument, actually. So it's, uh, this is, it is very going to be very sensitive to sequencing errors. Because as soon as you change one letter, well, you destroy that whole length k. And you will get multiple paths for the same thing. This one is actually uh, quite controversial, not memory efficient. People who believe in the string graph approach will say that it's, uh, the Bruin graphs are not memory efficient because you have a node for every single string of length k. People who do the Bruin graph approaches will say, no, 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 we are the ones who are memory efficient. It really is a, it's a trade off. If you have really, really, really high coverage and really short reads, the Bruin graphs are more memory efficient. If you have lower coverage and longer reads, they become much less so, much less memory efficient. So it's, you know, there is a trade-off. So the goal of the people who believe in string graphs is that there should be one node per read, or better, that there should be a way of reducing the amount of the number of the memory that's used by the graph. That the division into k-mers, it, since it's really arbitrary, you shouldn't be, have to do it. And there should be flexibility in the presence of sequencing errors. And this has led to sort of work on string graphs, which are um, based on something called an overlap graph. Here, you will start with your sequences, your reads, and you will not split them in any way. You will just directly build a graph from them. The nodes of your graph will be the reads. So every single node goes to a read. The edges are overlaps between them. And for example, the weights of the edges are lengths of the non-overlapping prefix. So for example, ACG to ACG TAC overlaps TACAT. Right? And three letters are shared. The prefix is ACG. So that will be the weight of this uh, prefix. Here, ACGTAC versus CATAC. There is no overlap. Well, there's no overlap by one letter, C. Right? But, and so the prefix is five letters, ACGTA. So, um, so, uh, so this is, uh, usually they are, it really depends on the, on the, uh, on the, pro, on the actual assembler. Uh, usually indels will, for Sanger reads and 454 reads, you definitely need to allow indels. For things like Selexa and solid reads, you usually don't allow indels. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, they could be allowed. Yeah. What's the reason for that? Uh, for what? Allowing uh, indels and Oh, basically, so whenever you have uh, an overlap, it indicates that you have two pieces of DNA, which you actually have read, you know, from two, diff two different reads. If there is a sequencing error, which is an indel, you want to be able to model it, and hence you will allow for overlaps which are not perfect, and including indels or, or sequences. I guess I also wanted to ask what's the reason uh, why you were not allowing indels for selects and solid because of the deep coverage? Uh, yeah, so for solid and selects, so the reason indels are not allowed typically is that, well, for solid, because of color space, indels are re relatively tricky. Uh, and uh, if you ask, so, uh, the AB uh, uh, people that I've talked to claim that there are no indel errors in their read data. Uh, I think that may also be due to the fact that uh, the tools that they've developed for working with color space data do not allow one to find indels. <laughs> uh, but, you know, their, their relationship between that is somewhat murky. Uh, so, um, for Selexa, the fraction of indel errors is very, very small. Um, uh, and as a result, because of the high coverage, you're basically better off discarding the read with such an error and dealing with everything else. So, okay, so I'm making this a directed graph. In reality, this would be a bi-directed graph. 
the exact same way that uh, I showed bidirected graphs earlier. So in reality, all of these, so HTTP, GTAC, the same exact node is also GTACGT. And that will overlap with other strings in whatever way. And uh, this would be a bidirected graph in practice. Yeah, I'm just making it directed for simplicity. So, and then what you do in this graph is basically try to find things like cycles and uh, and paths and longer paths that you could be supported. So, for example, this could be a circular walk. For example, A C G T A C. It would be T A C A T A C, uh, and then uh, G T A C, and then back into this one. Uh, so this is, for example, a circular walk on this. Uh, in case you're assembling a bacterial genome. Uh, there is something called transitively inferable overlap. So, for example, ACGTAC, CACAT, and then this CACAT. This walk will exactly spell this overlap with one letter. So, this overlap is something called, which is called transitively inferable. It can be inferred from these two edges, from this edge and this edge. So, these are overlaps that we'll want to remove. From our graph because they're actually redundant. Okay, so to build a string graph, you start with an overlap graph and remove these transitively inferable overlaps. So you start with something which will look potentially like this, and you remove all of these red edges because they can be spelled directly. And you end up with a graph which looks like this. And I apologize, you can't see these. There's there are also nodes between these, but uh, for some reason they're not coming through. Uh, the next thing you do is collapse chains. So from here, there's this read followed by this read, by this read, by this read, and then to this read. Well, if you're going to start walking along this path, you've got to finish it. You have no ways of leaving it. So all of these can be collapsed. And then all the edges get separated into two classes. There are required edges. These are edges between two nodes, uh, between two nodes that had internal vertices before. So all of these, th this path had internal vertices, so this is going to be a required edge. This is this node. This is going to be a required edge because there was an internal vertex right here. This is going to be an optional edge. The reason, since it doesn't contain a read, you're actually not sure that it's part of, a, of, of any path. So this is... Uh, this is basically all that there is to string graph. Just you build these, you find these required and optional edges, and then you output the required ones as your assembly. Oops, sorry. So the way that Myers formulated string graphs initially in 2005 is the goal is to find the shortest path using all of the required edges and any optional ones. Uh, he had some. He had some suspicions that maybe polynomial time may be easy to do computationally. Turned out to be and be hard as well, as I mentioned earlier. Well, once you're done with this, uh, so these two slides are out of order. I'm going to do them backwards. Uh, so from path to context, so you have reads and they overlap each other. This is what a path in your string graph may look like. But there could also be a repeat region in it, in which case we will have multiple reads in here where other reads are coming from a completely different genomic region. So this is going to actually lead that there is an edge going here, an edge going here, an edge through, and then edges which split. Uh, so this is going to be what the shape of the graph looks like. Uh, so you will typically merge reads up to potential repeat boundaries. This is like collapsing these paths. But what do you do with these? So, sorry, the two reads were out of order. Well, the way you can think about this is that you have an edges going in, then a repeat region, and then edges going out. Well, in order to figure out what is the right way of joining these together, you can use mate pair data. And this is why mate pairs are so important for assembly. If you have short reads, all of these edges will be relatively short because you will very often encounter repeats which will collapse the paths. 
But you can use mate pairs by looking at this. So you have red and green things, and they're somewhere nearby each other. There's some, some piece in between them, but it's not hopefully not too big. But then they should have mate pairs, right? So this reed will be paired with this one, and this reed will be paired with this one. And the question which you may want to ask is, well, is there a short path between A prime and B prime? Because if there is, that implies that these two edges should be next to each other, as opposed to these two edges. Uh, so you can do something called extra sort of path algorithm to find whether A prime and B prime are close to each other, and then join, if so, join these two edges together, and as a result, resolve the street. Yeah. Not quite the answer. Sure. So you got a repeat region. You got unique edge going in, unique edge going out, unique edge going in, unique edge going out. So you want to know which of these unique edges sort of belong with each other. The way to do it is you look at the reads which are in the unique regions near the repeat, and look at their mate pairs, which are located some distance away from over there. And then you ask, well, are the pairs close to each other? Because if the pairs are close to each other, that means these two regions are also close to each other. And hence, the right path through here would be like this, as opposed to like this. And this is only for mate pair, right? This is, exactly. Yeah, so this is why pair and data is so important, or mate pair data. Because unless you have th these paired reads, uh, you, there's no way. As soon as you get to any kind of a repetitive area, and oh, this is something I'm not mentioning, but when people talk about people talk about assembly, uh, so when biologists talk about repeat, they usually think transposons and things like that. Uh, when uh, computer scientists or people who do assembly talk about repeats, there is a very simple definition of a repeat. Uh, this is a piece of DNA that is longer than your read length that appears multiple times in the genome. A repeat is defined relative to your read length. The shorter your read, the more repeats your genome has. So, you know, if you have reads of length 25, then even short homopolymer stretches are repeats now. So, making assembly very, very difficult. Okay. Now let's take this. Okay. And the final stage of assembly is consensus calling. Uh, you get these reads. They got errors, for example, sequencing errors, like indels or single letter changes. You do multiple alignment of these reads. And at every single position, you call the most common letter. And or alternatively, you can take the best quality letter. So all of the reads have quality values. It's the, sort of the likelihood that they're a mistake. Uh, I'm actually not going to talk much about quality. Michael, are you going to talk about quality values much? Yes. You will. OK, great. So you'll hear more about quality values. Um, but um, you can use the best quality value or a consensus of some kind by weighted voting or you know any other way of predicting the best letter. Uh, here. And by now, there are many, many, many assemblers which are out there. Uh, for example, you know, one of the most popular ones and ones you will see used most for especially selected data is Velvet. And uh, this is a comparison from the Velvet paper which came out uh, a year and a change ago, where they claimed that they were able to do a much better job than all the previous assemblers, and they were. I mean, it's now there are other tools which do almost as well as Velvet. Uh, still tends to be the tool that everybody uses. Uh, in, in bioinformatics, there is, a and I think in all of science, there's a huge you know, con conservative mindset. Once you get a tool which works, you don't care about better tools which come along, you know, for better or worse. Uh, you know, there's a new tool which is 5% better. Who cares? Um, it's 50% better, probably, people will quit. Uh, so here they claim that the error rate is you know, 0.02%, 97% coverage, and N50. So whenever people compare assemblers, they talk about something called the N50, 
Uh, the end 50 is the length of the contig in which you have half your genome. So in contigs of this length or more, you will have gotten half your genome. This is the typical number which all people who compare assemblers work with. Uh, you typically don't want to look at your average contig length because that will be very, very short and very, not very meaningful. Because what you end up with is lots of long pieces and lots and lots and lots of really short ones. So people will typically talk about the NPC score, which is half the genome is in pieces this length or more. So 8.5K for, I think, s suits. Um, and the previous assemblers before Velvet were really a lot worse. Um, there is by now, uh, so, so by now there is a huge sort of set of um, assemblers available uh, for sh uh, next generation sequencing. So Velvet was sort of the first one which you know did really had really spectacular results for uh, short read assembly. All paths as well had has showed very good results. On the other hand, uh, I you know, I've never run all paths, and I've never seen anybody outside of Whitehead who has run all paths. Uh, so that's uh, you know. Uh, the results reported in the paper are absolutely spectacular, but you know, I, I, I have actually seen a few. Uh, Euler uh, is the, the original sort of Eulerian assembler based in the brewing graphs out of Tamsner's group, and the 2009 paper is ultra short reads, USR. Uh, this is beginning to sound like airplane names, um, but th they claim results better than Velvet in that paper. Uh, and the paper, uh, I think the paper title is something like Does Length Matter in Um So all of these uh, tools which I talked about work with letter space. And it turned out that assembling in color space is becomes a little bit trickier. And uh, as uh, Francis uh, promised, I'm going to now uh, actually tell you a little bit more about color space. I'll explain color space to you again. Uh, and. Uh, this is, you know, what color space reads look like, and this is what a consensus they look like when you're trying to call consensus. Um, here I have uh, reads, and they start with a letter and then have a whole bunch of numbers. And uh, if you didn't get what they meant from the first time, we'll, we'll try this one more time. And uh, you could, you know, try calling consensus based on the actual numbers. And, wow, that screwed up. The font was completely wrong. This, this should be all courier so that uh, you can actually see consensus. Sorry about this. Should I edit this? This is courier. What's going on? It should look something like this. I'm not sure why it got screwed up in translation between the PC and the Macs. Something, something went wrong. But you can see that there is, these should align and they, they should give you a consensus of some kind. Uh, apologize for this hiccup. And, sorry? The, bind, the printout and the binder is fine. Uh, yeah, but uh, see, that's, that's why, you know, we should, we should settle on one kind of technology, either a PC or a Mac. And, uh, sorry, a consensus is tricky, yes. Okay, well. Sorry? Well, it could be a PC's fault, I guess. You know, whenever it's, it's, it's a Microsoft. So, I, okay, let's just blame Microsoft. That's a lot easier. Like, ah, great question. What are these reads which have the letter? Uh, so, these are reverse complemented reads. Uh, color space and uh, works tricky. There is no reverse complement. It's actually reverse, but you have to push the letter through. So I, what I have actually done is I've just you know, reversed the whole read. Uh, so you don't, uh, it's, it's actually great. Uh, for those of you who are Unix hacks, and uh, if you're not, you will become one by the end of my lab. Uh, uh, there's a great command in Unix called rev, which will take a string and reverse it. So it's great for color space. So uh, uh, it's, uh, you just take a string and reverse it. So these are basically read from the opposite strand, which is why the, the letter is at the end. So this is basically a, to be a multiple of alignment of these reads. And then you call consensus and got and get some string, which has a letter and a whole bunch of numbers after it. And uh, 
you can then, you know, as Francis pointed out, since you have the first letter, you can translate it through. You can, you know, take and you know apply these rules and you know translate. It. The question which you, you know, which you may want to wonder about: what happens if you get one thing wrong? And well, if you have a regular string of DNA seed letters, if you screw up one letter, well, one letter is wrong. It'll have no effect on the next letter or the previous one. Right? That's how consensus works. You call every single position independently. So what happens in the case of color space? So let's go back and you know try to explain color space again. I, I, I took me probably a month to figure out color space, so if you guys didn't get it the first time, you know, it's probably fine. So this is how you know I explain color space in a slightly different way because that's how I actually understood it. So this is what the color space read looks like. It's a letter followed by a whole bunch of numbers. The letter is part of the linker, which joins the DNA to the, um, to the um, slide. So it's actually known. You know what it'll start with. And then you have a whole bunch of numbers. Well, Francis tried to explain this to you using this table, which is what ABI gives you, this table to have it figured out. And uh, in case you haven't gotten this from the First few, uh, you know, from the first part of my talk, I don't, I like graphs. Uh, so instead of using tables, I prefer to think of graphs. Uh, so this is uh, what something called in computer science a finite state automata. And uh, you have letters, and then you have numbers on the edges between them. And what you have is you're at some letter, and then you see a number, and that tells you where to go to. So you start at the T. When you see a zero, well, it tells you you should stay at the T because all the edges coming out, there's a zero, one, two, or three edge. So you stay at the T. Then you see a one. T on the one goes to a G. So the next letter should be a G. G followed by a two should be an A. Back to G, C, G, C, C. So this is what color space, this is a simpler way, I think, of thinking about color space. You're at some letter, you see a number, and that determines where you go in this sort of little state diagram. Uh, this also, it'll become a lot clearer now what happens if you get something wrong. What happens if, as you were reading this read, you got one color somehow wrong. Let's say you got this one where the zero is wrong, you should have gotten a two. What will happen? Well, it will start at the T, go to a T, to a G, to an A, but then we'll stay at an A. So we'll get that letter wrong. So what will happen at the next one? We will go to a T, an A, a G, a G, and A. And we get this string. And if we compare them, these, uh, it's not so, yeah. This I'll blame on the on Microsoft as well. It's not showing the, the second part of this. But you can see that actually the two strings are completely different after the scholar space error. So if you were to call color space consensus by just taking the consensus of all the colors and then translating through, if you get one letter wrong anywhere, you'll get the rest of the genome wrong. So um, probably not a very good idea. Um, will not, uh, that will not really work. Well, actually, there's ways of getting around this problem. And this is, has to do with the fact that there are uh, these things called translation. Let's forget about the first letter. And let's just think about the colors. What string of DNA could this represent? For different strings. And how will, how will they be different? by the four different first letters. And let's also think about the sort of the string with an error, just, you know, in parallel. And these, you know, will be different from this if they started with a T. But for every, since there's four possible strings, depending on where you started, right, when you start at the node, you'll never, the two paths will never uh, agree. So for this string with the zero, there's four possible translations. Starting with an A, a T, a G, or a T. So 
if you start at the T, which is where you're supposed to start because you know the first letter of a linker, you will actually be able to go through and translate up until the error and you get the right string, you get to G. But the string after that is going to be completely wrong, as I pointed out. But do you see anything interesting about this sort of set of strings compared to what we expected to see if there were no sequencing errors? One of them has a right sequence. One of them has a right sequence. Which one? Second. The second one. Yeah, this one's wrong, but this one, this is wrong, but this part actually matches it exactly. So if you basically, when you have a sequencing error, it's not that the rest of it is wrong. It's still right, but it's just in a different translation. You have to figure out which one of the other translations to use it, starting at that point. So you should be able, if you can compensate in some way. Uh, and jump to a different translation. So how would we know when we need to jump to a different translation? It, uh, really, you have an additional piece of information. The piece of information comes is the first letter of all of the subsequent reads. Because you got that letter at some point, that will tell you what the right frame should have been later on, so you can work your way back. So. This leads to something called the hidden Markov model, which you know I'm going to I'm going to skip the details of this. Uh, if you're really interested in hidden Markov models, I'll be glad to talk to you offline about it. Uh, but um, I, yeah, yeah. all right, this I'm definitely with. So the key thing is you you shouldn't just call col uh, colors because colors are redundant. If you're calling consensus, for example, 0, 0 could mean both an A or a TT. What you should do is you should call things both the colors and the letters simultaneously. Let's consider two positions on the genome. We don't know what they are going to be. Let's call them X, Y, and X, Y, and Z, so three positions. Well, X, Y is a pair, so it should correspond to a single color. So this is... Um, these are all the possible pairs of nucleotides that you could have at that position. And YZ is um, another pair. But the two of them actually overlap by a single letter. So the middle letter has to be the same. So the what we will do is we will allow one to give a walk sort of this graph where at every single position you have this, you know, a set of 16 possible nucleotides, but only allow it to follow from where the second letter will match the first letter of the next. Uh, so similarly, anything which ended with a T can go to a TT or to TA to a TC and so on. So this, if you're familiar with hidden Markov models, is a hidden Markov model. Uh, if you're not, don't worry about it. Uh, it's, uh, so then you have something called emissions. Uh, and for, you have color reads. So for every pair, you have a set of colors, which would be emitted by the pair. But you also have letters. If you have a T followed by a 2, you will know that the next letter is going to be a C. So this tells you which of these four frames you should be in. That at this point, you should really be in the C frame, unless this 2 was wrong. So. In the hidden Markov model, you have these emissions. You, you have color emissions, where an A is likely to generate a zero with high probability and everything else with a low probability. TT, exact same thing. With high probability, it will generate a zero, and with low probability, anything else. These are basically sequencing error, uh, the probability of a sequencing error. But as far as the letters go, an AA is likely to generate an A. And I arbitrarily would pick the second letter and said that that's the letter that we want to, to generate. Uh, and everything else with low probability, while a TT will have, with high probability, will allow for the generation of Ts, and uh, with low probability, anything else. So what this lets you to do in the, uh, in the context, of a context of a hidden Markov model is to say for every single position, 
what is the likelihood of the state that you are in. So, for example, you could say, I'm most likely in the state AT, and hence call the letter T at that position. Furthermore, what's really nice is it allows you to give a confidence value for every single letter. So this, um, this, yeah, this is completely screwed up for reasons which I do not understand. So what this shows, so is an output of a program which we will use tomorrow, is you get, start with a set of colors of phase three, you get the genomic sequence, but also for every single letter you sort of get a confidence. And uh, so a nine indicates a high confidence, a zero indicates very low confidence in that letter. And then at some point the program just says, I can have no more confidence to call these letters. They're just, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they're as likely to be right as they are to be wrong. So it'll output ends. So this is a program called Adir, which you guys will get to play with tomorrow. So just to recap, recap most, you know, the key points of what I've been trying to tell you over the course of the past uh, hour. So uh, there is, for different types of data, you need different assembly approaches. So for shorter reads, the Bruin graphs actually capture most of the information in your read data. Uh, Velvet and other similar assemblers will do a great job with short reads. Um, Velvet is a De Bruin graph based assembler, and so is Euler USR. For longer ones, string graph like approaches are better. So uh, approaches, um, uh, so IDEAR, for example, actually uses a overlap string graph based approach, not a De Bruin based approach. For longer, um, uh, so for a de novo assembly, when you're trying to really build a genome from scratch, read length is really key. And in the absence of read length, you need matrix. Um, so, um, and because read length is really key, there are many efforts to combine various types of data. So there's 454 four reads are now the long read. They're you know, almost 500 letters now, where Sanger was you know, 10 years ago. So there are many efforts which attempt to combine 454 four data with either solid or selexa data. Mainly selexa because color space is trickier and people are just sort of beginning to figure it out from a computational side. And, uh, but at the same time, color space is tricky, uh, but can be handled with the right computational tools. So as a biologist, so basically if you're a biologist, you shouldn't have to know that color space exists. That's the goal of computation, of, of, of the computer scientists in the room and of the bioinformaticians in the room. You should be able to hide color space away from the biologist uh, by making it everything look like letters. So, uh, and the key to this is the right computational approaches. Uh, okay, so thank you, and I'll be glad to take any more questions.